Hey guys, Adam here. Hope you guys are having a great holiday break. Uh, sorry that I haven't put out any videos in a long time. Uh, just been so swamped with work, uh, which is a good thing. It's actually stuff that I'm interested in and I'm having a great time with that, but I just haven't had time to do board repairs and, and therefore videos and stuff like that for a long time. But I have been getting a ton of requests on people asking me uh, to do a video on a logic probe, how to use a logic probe to fix a game. And my answer is always the same. I can't just do a video on a logic probe. I really have to explain um, how the board works. Uh, because if you don't really understand what the chips are doing, then knowing whether the signals are high or low isn't going to help you at all. So I decided that since I have a little time here in this holiday break to uh, try to put something together. And I'd like to do a couple of videos. This first one will probably just cover the basics on, on digital logic. Um, and this is common digital logic that you guys will find on all the games that you're, that you're working on. Um, you'll see it in the schematics and stuff like that. So hopefully after watching this video, some of that stuff will make sense to you. And uh, yeah, like I said, my goal is to kind of do a couple of these. This first one here I recorded uh, over the break. And I'll have a lot of the basics. And then maybe later on I'll do one on like the CPU circuitry. And then maybe a separate one on the video circuitry. You know, stuff that's common to all the games or whatever. Uh, so that's my plan. We'll see how it goes, uh, given my schedule and free time and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, hopefully this will give you guys some insight onto uh, what's going on in the, on the, the game boards and whatnot. If you got any questions, just leave me a comment, and hopefully I'll uh, get some time to answer them. So without further ado, here we go. All right, so before we jump into uh, digital logic, I just thought I would take a few minutes and just explain what digital means, okay? And so I have these two little graphs here. Uh, one I labeled analog and one I labeled digital. So the easiest way I can think to explain analog is to think of um, a dimmer in your house that controls uh, a light. Um, you know those rotary style that you can turn. And so if we were to you know draw a little graph, and on this side we're going to put you know the level of brightness from anywhere between zero and 100 percent. And then on this uh, axis we'll put time. And so you know at time zero you decide to turn on the light and so you're you're cranking the thing up until it reaches 100 percent and then you decide you want it dimmer so you turn it down and you're playing with the thing over time you can see that you have really an infinite uh, number of uh, levels of brightness anywhere between zero and 100 percent depending on how fine-tuned you're playing with this dimmer you can get all sorts of various values okay <coughs> excuse me uh, compare that to digital okay and digital is like any other light switch in your house. You just either flick the thing on or you flick the thing off. We still have our 0 and 100%, but really those are the only two values that that light can have. It's either off completely or it's on completely. And so you can see, you know, you just it's, it's off right now, and at some point in time you want to turn the thing on, and you do that, and it just goes bam, right to 100%. And then you turn it off, it goes to 0, and, and so on and so forth over time as you're playing with the light switch. Um, and, and so that's one. That's the the main difference is that in digital digital speak or whatever you want to call it, there's really only two values. It's either completely off or completely on. Where analog can be any variation or combination between. And so I wrote down these terms because I'm probably going to be using these, you know, throughout my my discussions. And um, I just wanted to make sure that I kind of threw them out here so they wouldn't be confused. So when I'm talking about something being on or off or true or false or one or zero, high or low. They're all the same, okay? I mean the same thing. If it's on, if it's true, if it's one, if it's high, it's up here, okay? And if the signal is off or if it's false, zero or low, and it's down here, all right? So I just want to throw that out there so that you guys can understand as I'm, as I'm talking about this a little bit more. All right, so now that we talked about uh, analog and digital, what digital means, let me try to explain how that applies to your arcade game. So... Your arcade game PCB, all right, 99% of the stuff on there is all digital, okay? And it runs off of a 5-volt rail, 5-volt power supply. So what that means is if you were to start probing your signals with an oscilloscope, okay, and not, a, not a logic probe, we'll get to that, but an oscilloscope actually measures kind of like a voltmeter graphically what's going on uh, on that line. So if you were to probe any one of those digital signals on your PCB, it would look a lot like this picture here that we did, where it would, you know, nice sharp edges, hopefully, um, but it would be bouncing around. You know, it would be go zero volts, and it would go to five volts for a while, and zero volts for a while over time, and who knows? I mean, it, it, depending on the 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 purpose of that signal, you know, it's going to be doing different things. But 
the key thing to understand here is that all of the digital logic on your PCB, uh, with some small exceptions, is running off of a 5 volt power supply, okay? So when I say that a signal is high, when I say that a signal is a logical one or that it's on, it means that it's very close to, if not equal to, 5 volts. It's up in this range, okay? And if I say that a signal is off or that it's a zero or that it's low, it means it's down in this range, You're very close to, if not zero, okay? So when you get a logic probe, and actually let me pull one out here. So this is my logic probe. I don't, I don't say that this is the best logic probe in the world. I found this years ago and it served me well, so I've never had a need to get another one. This is an HP uh, logic probe. What does it say here? Uh, a 545A, okay, and it lights up when I, when I, uh, when I start probing it and whatnot. But it's this, the, the job of this probe is to tell me what the signal is doing. Is it down here? in this range or is it up here in this range and actually I think I have a better picture for that uh, right here okay so the job of this probe is to measure the pin that I'm pushing on and tell me is it below this kind of mid-range here is it a zero or is it above that range in other words is it a one okay And because there's really only two states that that a digital signal can have it's either a one or a zero all right how does it know? Well, you gotta you gotta power it up. You gotta put it onto the five volts, and then you put it on ground. Once you do that, then it can calculate this mid level here, and then when you stick your this pin on a signal, it can do the math or whatever internally, and it can figure out: oh, is it a logical one or is it a logical zero? Okay, pretty simple. Um, but this probe in and by itself is not going to help you solve problems. You need to understand first of all what digital means, which we kind of covered that. But then, what are these little chips doing? Are the chips that you're probing, what are they designed to do? And that's what we're going to get to next. All right, so if you pull out any of your schematics for any game, okay, you're going to see a lot of these little symbols, all right? And these are called logic gates. And they're called logic gates because they control the flow of digital signals, okay, through your, uh, through your PCB. And so there's all different types, and they all look funny. Um, and so the next, this next section is I'm going to try to explain to you, starting from the simplest to the more complex, what these gates do and how they work, okay? So let's start with the absolute most simplest, where's my marker, uh, gate that I can draw up, okay? And uh, actually, I think I can probably do two at a time. So let me just draw a line here, all right? So the, the simplest one is a buffer. And a buffer looks like this, looks like a triangle. All right, and with every logic gate, <clears throat> you have one or more inputs and one or more outputs, and information is flowing in one direction, okay? And so let's call this A, and let's call this, uh, I don't know, let's call it Z, okay? So if you look at, uh, and let me just actually take a segue here and throw this up, if you look at a TTL data book or logic data book, um, you'll find what they call truth tables. And little these truth tables explain basically how each one of these gates uh, work. I'm going to go over that. Don't worry about it. Um, but I just want to throw this up here. I actually have a physical copy that I find very valuable. I keep this with me um, on the bench when I'm debugging um, boards and stuff. Uh, I love it. You don't need to have a physical copy. I'm mean, sure you could find one somewhere. Uh, but there's actually um, one on my website, and I'll throw up the link right now. If you follow that link, you can go to um, a soft copy of uh, the, the TTL data book, which will basically tell you uh, what all those little chips on your arcade uh, game do, okay? Assuming they're TTL, all right? And so you'll, I'll probably reference this actually throughout this video as I talk about different uh, logic gates and uh, explain basically uh, how they're implemented in, in some of these parts. But I just wanted to kind of throw that up there right now. So if we look at what's called the truth table uh, for this gate, this is called a buffer, all right? And its job is to basically take whatever's on A and pass it to Z. That's it. Does it manipulate the signal in any way? If this is a 1, this will be a 1. This is a 0, this will be a 0, okay? It's as simple as it gets. So the truth table for that would look like this, okay? This is what a truth table looks like. It's very simple, okay? Inputs are on the left. Outputs are on the right, and you just go through all the possible combinations that A could be. Well, it's simple. A is a digital signal. It can only have two values. It can either be 0 or a 1. So in this case, if the input is 0, 
the output is 0. If input's a 1, the output's a 1. That's it. That's the truth table for this guy, okay? So, let me segue back to this real quick. <clears throat> I wonder if I can do this uh, quickly here. If we were to look at... Let me see what I can find. You know what I lied to you? I tried to find the truth table for my buffer, but I think because it's so simple, they're not putting it in the, uh, in the data book here. So sorry, but that's all right. Uh, I think you can kind of get the idea of, of how this thing works. Uh, I'm sure there'll be truth tables for the more complex ones. So let's move on to the next one. The next one is an inverter. An inverter looks almost identical to a buffer, okay? The difference is this bubble on the end there. And we'll write our inputs and our outputs, okay? The job of an inverter is to invert or flip uh, the signal, okay? And so if we write our truth table here, all right, and we draw all the combinations for the inputs, zero and one, the output would be the opposite, okay? That's what that little bubble means. Remember that because we'll be going over other gates Okay, some of which have bubbles and some of which don't. And all that bubble really means is if you were to take the output for a certain gate, you're going to flip it. Okay, that's all it does. I'll use that term flip because it just means that you're taking uh, a value of uh, whatever it is, zero, and you're flipping it to a one or a one, you're flipping it to a zero. Okay, so does that make sense? Hopefully I didn't rush through that. But these are the two simplest gates that you'll come across. And um, this kind of gives you an overview of some simple truth tables, okay? We're going to move on to a little bit more, more um, complex ones now. So the next two, all right, that we should go over, one is an OR gate, okay? And it looks like this. Don't ask me why they decided to draw them this way, but this is how they look, okay? It looks like that. And we've got a, an input A, an input B, and again our output Z, okay? So if we would draw all of our possible combinations for A and B, we fix that there, and here's our output Z, all right? There's actually four combinations of inputs. These guys could both be zero. We could have a zero and a one. We could have a one and a zero, and a one and a one. Now the way the OR gate works, is if either one of these signals, well, let me, let, me, let me say it this way, if A is a 1 or B is a 1, then Z will be a 1, okay? That's it. So you can just go through this fairly quickly and say, is this, if this is a 1 or this is a 1, I know my output will be a 1, okay? So how about this? No, none of those guys are. This one, yeah, B is a 1. How about here? Yeah, A is a 1. How about here? Yeah, they're both, okay? So you can see how that works. If A is a 1 or B is a 1, then the output will be a 1. Okay? Pretty simple. Uh, the next one is an AND. Okay? It looks very similar to this, but it's a little different. This part's flat. Okay? And it looks like this. Sorry about that. Okay? And the way this works is, if A is a 1 and B is a 1, then Z is a 1. And that's it. Any other condition, that guy's not going to be a 1. So let's draw him out. A and B and Z. So we have all our combinations, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, okay? A and B have to be a 1 in order for Z to be a 1. So how about this case? Nope. That case? Nope. That case? Nope. This case? Yes. That's the only case, okay? You see the difference there? So now, now let me jump to the TTL data book and I should be able to find something that corresponds to that. Um, if I just take a quick peek in the beginning here and try to find... Uh, what do we got here? Here we go. 74... Oh, actually, let me do the OR first. Do I have any ores here? Um, I should be able to find one. I think a 32, is that right? 32, yeah. So a 74, 32. says here, page 628. And... Alright, 
Is this still on? You know what? I switched data books. I have a few of them in the lab here. And um, I think some of them assume that you already understand how some of the simpler gates work. Um, but this one I like. This one's got some good stuff in here. So I think uh, a 7432 should be a two input OR. Bingo, here we go. Um, hold on one second, I'm on the wrong page. Here we go. And I don't know if you can see this, but here's our two input OR. Let me get my little pencil here. Um, and you can see the same truth table, A, B, and they chose to call the output Y, okay? And so you can see here what they're saying is, uh, if A is high, X means don't care, okay? So whenever you see an X in a truth table, it means don't care. In other words, if A is a one or a high, then who cares what B is? Because all we need for Y to be high is A or B to be high, okay? You understand that? Hopefully it's not too confusing. Similarly with B, okay, if B is high, then who cares what A is? We know that the output will be high. But if both are low, then the output will be low, all right? And this shows you a picture of the gate, shows you where the inputs are and the outputs, and it shows you the logic equation, which you don't need to know about, okay? The other thing that's useful is this little picture here. So what this is showing you, and some data books, hopefully the one that I have online, actually has a picture that's drawn inside of it. Um, do I have that back here? No, I don't. I have that in another one. Hold on. 32. Yeah, that's kind of what I, that's what I like about this one here, um, is that it actually shows you a little picture, okay, of the, of the part. Here's pin one. And then it shows you where all the, how all the little gates are drawn. Um, but this one does the same thing. It just does it differently by showing you, well, here's what one gate looks like with A, B, and Y. And then it shows you the, all of the different the signals here. 1A, 1B, 1Y. So you know there's one gate hooked up there. And then 2A, 2B, and 2Y. You know there's another OR gate tucked in over there. And so there's just two different ways of representing the same information. But anyway, that's an OR gate. So let's take a look at an AND gate. Okay, and so here is a uh, 7408. You can see the picture of the AND gate. And you can see that the, the table is actually simplified a little bit. They're basically saying um, if A and B are high, the output will be high. If A is low, then who cares what B is? Because we need them both to be high in order for that one to be high. So it's basically saying if A is low, then who cares about B? We know that the output would be low. If B is low, who cares about A? We know that the, out the output will be low. Okay, does that make sense? And then it shows you also the, the chip, and it shows you how they're all connected up. So there's four of these guys tucked into here. Alrighty, so that's, those are the two, um, aside from like the buffer and the inverter, those are probably the next two simplest ones. Um, and then we can move on to some other ones here. Actually, I think what I'm going to do is just leave this here because the next two are, are variants of this, okay? So remember we talked about before um, about the difference between a buffer and an inverter was that little bubble, bubble there. And the bubble basically means you're going to flip or invert the signal. And so the next two, okay, is a NOR and a NAND, okay? And the only difference between an OR and a NOR is you've got that bubble. And the only difference between a NAND and an AND is you have the bubble. Okay? The guts of the gate work exactly the same. The only difference is the output is flipped before it's finally sent out. So this would be for an, uh, an OR. And a NOR would be the exact opposite. Okay? It would be 1, 0, 0, 0. Alrighty? And for a NAND, if this is an AND, and this is a NAND, then it would be this, you know, the, the same thing, but just flipped. One, 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 zero. Alrighty? And so throughout your schematics, and I encourage you to just, you know, even as we've gotten this far, take a look at your schematics. Take a look at Pac-Man schematics, Galaga schematics, whatever you've got. You'll, these things will start making sense to you now. You can see these gates all across your schematics, some with bubbles, some with not. And, um, and now you're starting to get a feel for what these things are doing, okay? 
One other thing I should note before we move on, um, sometimes you'll see, you know, this is what's called a two input gate or two input or and a two input and. There's no reason why you can't have uh, a three input or, All right? So let's draw that out. Okay, so now I've got three signals. I've got A, B, and C, and I've got my output Z. Just like before, the logic is the same. The, the, the equation for this guy is the same. This has to be a one, or this one, or this one, in order for that one to be a one. And so if we were drew out the truth table real quick, of course the truth table is bigger now because we've got more inputs. The more inputs you have, the more uh, the, the, the larger this truth table is going to become. All right, so if we draw all the possible combinations, okay, where we used to have four, now we've got eight. It pretty much just doubled. So they could all be zeros, or this one could be a one. Zero, one, one. One, zero, zero, one, one. I'm sorry, whoops. zero, one, 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 one. Okay, eight combinations. Logic's very simple. If uh, any of these is a one, the output would be a one. So you can kind of just rip through this really quick and say, yep, 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 yep. Okay? So you'll see ands, so you'll see ors, um, with uh, at least two, if not more, uh, inputs. And it just, it just shows you that you can take a, a concept like an or and and, and you can expand it to any number of inputs, okay? I'm not going to draw out the and, but you can kind of get the idea. Um, everything, okay, in an and, all of the outputs would be zero, except for the one case where all of the inputs are one, because that's how an and works. All inputs have to be a one. All righty, so let's move on. All right, so let's see, what else? Um, <coughs> actually, let's do two more real quick before we move on to some more complex stuff. Uh, you've seen the OR, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, there's a variant of that called the XOR, or exclusive OR. Okay, don't let the name scare you, it's not too bad. It looks just like an OR gate, all right, except that there's another, another line right here. Okay, and let's draw all our signals here, A, B, and Z. The way an XOR works, okay, well, let's review the OR. So the OR is, if this is a 1 or this is a 1, the outcome will be a 1. Exclusive OR means um, that only one of these can be a 1 to drive this to be a 1. And so if we go back to the OR real quick, all right, and our truth table looked like this. Actually, let me leave that right there. The truth table for an XOR is very similar. Z. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. It only wants to see cases where one of these is a one in order for the output to be a one. So that's a zero, that's a one, that's a one. And contrary to the OR, this one would be a zero. Because remember, it's only looking for a case where one of the inputs is a one. If both of them are a one, no dice. It, it makes it a zero. Okay. Uh, so that's the XOR. And the other gate, which is actually a little more complex, but actually not too bad, uh, is called a MUX. All right. And it kind of looks like this. All right. And this is kind of this is kind of a neat gate. I like these actually. V and this is an S or a select and this is a Z okay and this is basically just it's like a traffic cop okay it just sits there and switches between A and B okay S decides who gets to go pass through okay so let's draw this out um, actually the easiest way to draw it out is to forget about A and B up here and just do something like this okay if S is a zero then uh, Z will be whatever A is, okay? If, if, so if, let's say, if S is a 0 and B is a 0, well, the 0 passes through. If S is a 0 and A is a 1, then the 1 passes through, okay? It doesn't matter what A is. If S is a 0, it takes that signal and it just passes it right through, okay? If S is a 1, then it's in this position. The switch is in this position. And whatever B is will get passed through to Z, okay? So that's a MUX. So let me see if I can dig up some of these for you in the data book. Um, 
just so you can get an idea of what some of these things look like. All of these gates that I'm showing you exist in physical form uh, in the form of some TTL part that's probably sitting on your board. Um, let's see if I can find an XOR for you. There we go. Alrighty, so that is on page 765. I actually might have this in this book. There we go. So here's an XOR, a 74, what is it, 86? And you can see it up here. There's four of them in this part. Kind of looks like what I drew there. And then you can see the truth table down here, or maybe you can't. Um, actually, that's, yeah, okay, so that's the, that's the truth table for the XOR. I'm just thinking of the mux. But you can see here that the only case in which the output is high is if one or the other input, but not both, is high. All right, so that's a mux. I'm sorry, that is a XOR. And now let's see if we can find a mux here. It's actually good that I'm going through this, these books because that's reminding me of certain things. Uh, for example, another, another term for a mux is a selector. Let me just throw that on here. Selector. Because what it's actually doing is it's selecting you know, either A or B. Um, this picture is not really as de defined as the one that I drew here, but you can see uh, this is a selector or a multiplexer a mux, and I think there's four in here. This is actually one that, that's used on uh, like the punch-out backboard to select between the upper and lower screens and stuff like that. But anyway, you can see the select going in, and then there's uh, 1A, 1B, and 1Y, so those are the two inputs, and that's the output for that mux. And you get another one for two, and another one for three, and another one for four. Their truth table is a little bit more uh, complex because it actually draws out all the possible combinations of A and B. And I took the shortcut of just saying, well, it really doesn't matter because whatever A is, when the select is zero, is going to end up on Z and so on, um, so on and so forth for B. But you can kind of, you know, use this as an exercise if you want, kind of go through this and make sure it makes sense to you. But anyway, I just wanted to show you that, you know, all of these things that we're talking about, you know, actually exist in some TTL part, one or another. And uh, you can find them in your schematics and you'll find them on your PCBs. All right, so now that we went over a couple of gates here, um, let's go back to the logic probe and we can kind of review how we would use a logic probe to debug some of these gates, okay? So let's pull out our logic probe here. And like I showed you before, there's a couple of clips here. One goes on five volts, one goes on ground. And in this, log, uh, this probe in particular will light up. Um, it won't get very bright, but it'll light up a little bit just to let you know that the thing is on, okay? So then what you want to do is you want to pick a gate uh, that you suspect is bad and you want to stick it on the output, okay? Now, if the output is low, okay, is a zero, then the light will go off. And if the output is high, or a one, then it will get uh, even brighter, okay? And again, that's for this probe. I don't know what, what your probe may do. So you stick it on the end there, and you figure out whether it's high or low. Now, uh, most often than not, in fact, what you actually want to see uh, is that it's not high or low, okay? In other words, this light is not all the way on or all the way off. It's actually flickering on and off, on and off because um, there's traffic that's flying through, okay? Logic signals are, are propagating through um, your schematic and uh, they're always changing depending on what's going on with the board and everything like that. They're high and low, high and low, and they're flying all over the place. And so that's what you wanna see, actually. You want, you know, as you're probing these signals, if you're seeing this thing blinking like mad, that's a good thing. That lets you know that things are alive and they're working. What you don't wanna see is a signal that is just pegged high all the time or pegged low all the time, okay? That should very rarely ever happen. And that's usually a good indication that there's something wrong. So what I typically do in, is, you know, I have an understanding of the schematics and eventually we'll get to that point. Um, but I have an understanding of the schematics and I'm looking at sections of the schematic where I think the problem may be. And I just start picking gates and I start looking at the outputs and I'm looking for a case where the output is stuck high or low, okay? When I see, let's take this, this gate for example, and let's pretend that it's an OR, so forget the bubble for a second. Okay, so I'm probing an output, and all of a sudden that thing is, is pegged low, okay? Well, I know by looking at the truth table, the only way that that can happen is if both the inputs are low, okay? So then what do I do? Well, I go back to those inputs, and I see, is that the case? Is A and B low? If one of these is high, or if one of these is toggling, meaning that it's going high even for a moment, well, then this should never be uh, low all the time, okay? So as soon as I see something like that, bam, I know that this guy is not functioning properly according to the truth table, and I pull him out and I replace him with one, you know, that is. Similarly for the AND gate, you know, I do the same thing. I stick it out on here, 
and I see that this guy is pegged high. Okay, well, the only way that can happen is if both of these guys are high, right, according to our little truth table here. So if either one of these is low, even for a moment in time, well, then this should never be high all the time, and in, that, in which case that guy's, you know, an issue, and I would pull him out. So to kind of show you a little bit more in detail, you're never going to see just a, a gate just sitting out there in your schematic all by itself. You know, it's always connected with a bunch of other things going on. And so what I usually will do is I'll start here, and I'll, I'll measure with my probe. Is it high or low? Is it toggling? Okay, and then I check the input. Does that make sense? Yep, okay. And I just keep kind of working my way back, okay? Now, if this was toggling, then I probably wouldn't work my way back. But if this is high, why is this high? Is it because the gate is bad? Well, I don't know. i got to check this point, okay? If I check this point, and I look at my truth table, and it looks like that this inverter is doing its job, well, then I just keep going back, okay? Is this AND gate doing its job? I measure him. Oh, no, something's wrong here, okay? And I measure this guy here. And so you want to start at a, at a fixed point, and then you want to work your way back, okay? And if you convince yourself that a gate is doing its job, well, then that just means that something down here is causing a problem up here, okay? So start here, work your way back, work your way back, until you find a gate that looks uh, sketchy, and then you replace them, okay? And I'll go into... Um, some of the some of the most common circuits and stuff on the other boards, like um, you know Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, and all that good stuff. But for right now, this is just a you know a tutorial, just an example of of how to kind of pick a, a section of a schematic and, and kind of go through and debug a little bit. All right, so now we're going to talk about something that's a little bit more complex, but hopefully not too complex. Okay. Um, your board, your game board, needs to have a concept of time, okay? It's, it's writing things to memory, and then later in memory needs to read those back and understand them and things like that. So this, there's this concept of time that's going on in your board. And the way that that's accomplished is through a clock, okay? And a clock is just very simply a toggle, I'm sorry, a, a binary signal that just toggles between 1 and 0. And it just keeps doing that in a very regular fashion, okay? Um, some games run at you know six megahertz, and that just basically means that the the frequency of this clock is six megahertz. Okay, that's that's running the whole board. Some games run at twelve megahertz. There's all variations. You can look it up on uh, on Clav and on Mame and stuff like that, and you'll figure out what rates these games run at. But the whole gist here is just to understand basically how this element works. <clears throat> okay, so this element is called a flip flop or a register, and uh, like the other gates that we've seen, it has an input, and in this case, it has two outputs. Okay. Something that you'll probably see in the schematic, you'll see signals with a little line over the top, okay? So you can see there's an output here, Q, and then there's an output, Q, with a line. Some people call it Q bar because it looks like a little bar on top, okay? All Q bar really is, or when you see a signal with a line over it, all that means is that it's the original signal and it's inverted, it's flipped, okay? So if we were to, actually I can draw this in here, this would be Q, and if I sent Q through a little inverter, draw my little bubble there, then this would be Q with a bar, okay? Does that make sense? So when you look at your schematics, lots of times you'll see a bunch of uh, inverters, you know, kind of scattered throughout. You'll see a certain signal name over here, and then the signal name, the exact same signal name with a bar on top. That just means that it's inverted. It's just flipped, okay? Um, so the way that this flip-flop works is you have a clock that's feeding into it so that this thing has some concept of time, okay? And every time that the clock goes from low to high, it's, you can think of it as a camera. It takes a snapshot of what D is, and it sends it out the, the output Q. Okay? Once that snapshot is taken, D can, can be any value. It can go high and low, it can move all around. This output will stay fixed until the next picture is taken at the next rising edge. Okay? They call that a rising edge when it goes from low to high. So you can see here, all right, clock's toggling, toggling. At this moment in time, D changes, all right? The output doesn't change, though, until D is sampled at the next uh, rising edge. As soon as that rising edge happens, it takes a snapshot of D, and you can see the output Q changes, okay? And then similarly, downstream, you can see, you know, D changes right here, but it's before the rising edge, and so you don't see anything changing on Q until that rising edge happens. It takes a snapshot of D, and it pops out on Q right there. So this is how, uh, this is how information is stored. Uh, you've got some clock that's running, and then uh, D is doing whatever it needs to do, and then um, the clock basically you know samples it in different periods in time. So how would you debug something like this? Well, again, you know, look for cases where you know your your outputs are just stuck at a fixed value, 
and if the input is toggling and the clock is obviously toggling, then something doesn't seem right. M most often than not, what uh, if for boards that are like completely dead, you'll find that a lot of these outputs are pegged high, and then when you go and check the clock, you'll see that the clock is actually either high all the time or low all the time. And then what you would do is just follow that clock circuit back, you know, like I was showing earlier. You know, if, the, if this was your clock and it's stuck, then you would start working your way back and figuring out, okay, what, what is it that's generating the clock that is causing you problems? All right, so this last one we're going to talk about is a set reset flop or a set reset register. And it's basically the same as uh, the regular flop, or the regular register that we just talked about with a couple of added features. You'll notice that we have two more inputs now. We have an S, which stands for set, and C, which stands for clear or, or reset. And basically what those signals do is allow you to force the output to be either a high, if we want to set it, or zero, or low, if we want to clear it, irregardless of what D is doing. And so if you look at the truth tables, it'll mention, you know, when clock is going from a low to a high, um, if set is a 1, then this will be forced to a 1. Or if clear is a 1, it'll be forced to a 0. Okay, so it's set and reset. Um, what you also will notice is that uh, on these flops, usually uh, there is a, an inversion on these inputs. So there's a little bubble. And all that means is, under normal cases, um, when a, when a signal is a 1, it would mean something, okay? So like if this was a 1, it would set it. But by having that inversion there, they really want to set this, this flop when S is a 0, okay? So remember, that bubble means it's, it's inverted. And so in this case here, now that we've got these bubbles here, if S is a 0, then Q would be set. And if C is a 0, then Q would be cleared. Does that make sense? And so uh, take a look at the data book. It'll kind of give you a little timing diagram. I didn't uh, put it in here because it's kind of verbose. It's, it's, you know, it's, it, there's quite a bit to it. Um, but you can get an idea as to how it works uh, based on the clock and then based on you know, what these signals are doing. Um, so how would you debug something like this? Well, like, like the, the normal flip-flop, you want to take a look here on the output and see is this thing just high or low all the time. But there's a difference now. If this is high all the time, then you, what you want to do is you want to take a look at this set input. Is the set low all the time, which would set this? If so, okay, well, then maybe there's, there's something wrong here. Um, similarly, if this is low all the time, we'll take a look at the clear. Is clear low all the time? All right, well, then that means there's something downstream that's forcing this guy to be cleared all the time. So it's similar to the, the normal flip-flop, but it's just got some, some other features, the set and the reset, that kind of throw a little extra in there. So something to consider when you're, when you're debugging this guy. You know, I was going to wrap this up, and then I realized there's probably one more thing I should cover very quickly, and that's this concept of floating. Uh, you've probably heard me say that uh, in previous repair videos. Oh, I found a signal that's floating. There's my problem. And so let me just talk about this real quick. So if I have a gate, let's say I have a two-input OR, and my marker's fading on me here. Uh, let's see if I can draw that a little better. So we have a two-input OR, and here's my output. Okay. Now you've seen previously where, um, you know, if I stick my probe here and the signal is low, then the light will go off, okay? And if I stick my, my probe there and the signal is high, well, then the light will get brighter. Now, if I'm doing anything with my probe, if I'm just, you know, if it's just sitting out here in space, the light will be on, but it'll be dimly lit just to let me know that the thing is powered up, okay? But once I stick it on a pin, it should do something. And what I found uh, in many cases, actually, is that I would stick my probe on a pin and it was the output of a gate and the light wouldn't change it would just stay dimly lit and that tells me that this signal this pin here is is floating and what that means is it's as if someone took a pair of scissors and snipped the end off okay so this gate is not driving the signal in fact nothing's driving the signal it's just a wire that's sitting out in space it's floating in space okay uh, what we want to see is this guy to be connected all the time and have some value on there, one or zero, or you know, toggling between one and zero, whatever. And so keep an eye out for that. If you find uh, you're looking at a gate and the signal is floating, um, it should really never happen uh, for these kind of gates anyway. Similarly, take a look at the inputs. If the output seems sketchy, take a look at the inputs and make sure that the inputs aren't floating. Now, one thing to be aware of though is that in some cases, in fact in many cases, <clears throat> Let me see if I can grab my book here. So we talked about this before, right? Here is uh, the 7432. 
It's a quad OR gate. You can see there's four OR gates here. Now maybe the schematic only needed three out of the four. And so you're probing the inputs to this fourth OR gate and you're like, oh, it's floating, this, this chip is bad. Well, maybe not. Maybe they just didn't need that fourth gate, okay? So take a look at your schematics. Take a look at the pins, right? Because every gate in your schematic should have a pin, uh, sorry, a pin number next to it to let you know where it lies in this package and make sure that the gate that you're probing is actually in use. If it is in use, no input should ever be floating, okay? And if it's a gate like this, a normal quadruple two input, you know, OR gate, then none of the outputs should be floating either. And similarly with the other gates like the XOR and the AND and whatnot. Um, so it's just, it's a matter of looking at the schematic, understanding it, Looking at here, making sure that you're picking a um, a gate that's actually in use, and then and then keeping an eye out for these kind of things. Well, guys, I think that's going to do it for this first video. Did you find that useful? Um, I hope so. And uh, I'm probably going to, like I said before, I want to do a couple other ones. Probably get into um, some circuitry that's common to, let's say, CPU boards, right? Because most games are are cut into two sections: a CPU section and then a graphic section. So uh, maybe do a video on the CPU. Uh, side of things and then do another video on the graphic side because they're very common um, and once you understand the fundamentals then you can start debugging oh is this a CPU issue or a graphics issue um, but we did we did pretty well in this video we covered a lot of stuff covered a lot of the basic logic gates covered digital logic what it means uh, covered some even some flip-flops and this whole concept of uh, signals floating and whatnot and we're clocking in about 40 something minutes that's a pretty sizable video I think to get started um, so dig into those schematics, um, dig into that data book. I'll, again, I'll, I'll put a link and I'll put it uh, down below so you can grab it there as well. And let me know what you think. If you guys have any questions about stuff that I covered in this video, uh, just leave a comment and I'll do my best, uh, time permitting, to answer them and hopefully help you guys out. So I think that's it for this one and we'll catch you on the next one.